perform anesthesias, anesthesia for post anesthesia care nurses. This is a seven video series on the basics of pharmacology and anesthesia techniques for the peri anesthesia care nurse. We, a group of five outstanding senior students from the University of South Carolina School of Medicine Nurse Anesthesia Program and one CRNA, have created this series in the hope it will help the transition into the peri anesthesia world. The series attempts to shine a bit of light on the techniques anesthesia uses during surgery, as well as explain the basics of the pharmacology behind our drug uses. This is by no means a series that will explain everything that happens during anesthesia, but our hope is that you, the peri anesthesia nurse, will find our report a little less intimidating and a little more informative. After all, the better you understand the report, the better you can take care of the patient. And ultimately, this will increase the safety and satisfaction for both your patient and yourself. The group consists of Alexandra Horman, BSN RN, CCRN, Braden Seidler, BSN RN, Jordan Coleman, BSN RN, CCRN, Kelsey Squires, BSN RN, CCRN, Victoria Koch, BSN RN, and Michael Storm, DNAP, CRNA, CCRN. The videos can be watched separately, but there are some references among the videos and the basics of the pharmacology along the way. Therefore, it may be beneficial to watch the series in order. Either way, have fun and don't forget to download the accompanying handouts. These handouts are the complete transcripts of the narrations and include all relevant pictures from the videos. This video series is sponsored by Storm Anesthesia and Palmetto Health Richland Anesthesia Department. Enjoy and let's get started. Hello everyone, my name is Jordan Coleman. I'm a senior student nurse anesthetist at USC with the class of 2018. I'm very excited to be talking with you about neuromuscular blocking agents. This is a topic that is important to you as these drugs are commonly used during surgery and you are the excellent providers that are recovering the patients we use them on. It will be greatly beneficial to all of you, I think, to be familiar with these drugs and how they work on a deeper level because it will allow you to have a better understanding of what's going on under the surface with some of your patients as they're in the recovery process. Our goals for this lecture are to understand the benefits and risks of neuromuscular blocking drugs during anesthesia. We want to become more familiar with the side effects of these drugs and the reversal agents we use. These first two points are going to make up the bulk of this lecture. If you understand the underlying anatomy and physiology of why and how these drugs work, you're going to be golden. Instead of memorizing a slew of numbers and side effects, this information will sink in and you'll remember as a result of that. We also want to know how to monitor depth of blockade and adequacy of reversal. And to wrap things up, we'll look at some other assessment tools that you can use to help provide safer care for our patients. Just a quick look at how we'll proceed through topics over the next 50 minutes. We'll start with a review of nerve conduction as well as the transition of the neuromuscular junction. This is where all of our drugs work, so we'll spend a good bit of time here. Next, we'll dig into the specific drugs we use to relax our patients and the differences between them. After that, we're gonna spend some time reviewing the anatomy and physiology of the autonomic nervous system. This is so important because our reversal agents, which we'll discuss afterwards, have a huge impact on these systems. We'll touch briefly on how we monitor the depth of blockade during anesthesia, as well as physical assessments. Ultimately, I want you to walk away feeling like you have a better understanding of what's going on beneath the surface with these drugs. I want you to feel like you can provide safer care to your patients and be prepared for complications you may see in the future. Here are a few quick keywords I want to sync us up on before we get going. A neurotransmitter is a chemical produced by nerve cells to send signals to other cells. Acetylcholine is just a specific neurotransmitter. Action potential is a brief reversal of transmembrane voltage across an excitable membrane. Polarization is a difference in electrical charge in one part of a cell compared to another part of the same cell. The neuromuscular junction is the point at which a neuron connects to a muscle fiber. 
A competitive antagonist is a substance that binds to a receptor but does not activate it. It must compete with other substances to bind. Most of these I'll explain multiple times, but if you want to reference any of them, feel free to return to this slide at any point. So let's get started with a quick refresher on nerve cell conduction, because it's important to understand how these drugs work. Looking at this picture, on the left side is the cell body, the long stalk in the middle is the axon, and on the right you have the axon terminals, and cell signaling is moving from left to right. Now, as you've noticed, there are some plus signs outside of the axon and negative signs inside. This is because at a resting state, neurons have a negative charge relative to the outside of the cell. This is also known as being polarized. Each side has a different charge. This is a result of electrolyte concentrations. Outside of the cell is a large concentration of sodium, while the inside contains a lot of potassium. Now, these concentrations are maintained with the sodium-potassium pump. And an easy way to remember which one is on which side of the cell is this. Look at the serum values for these two. Sodium is about 135 to 145, while potassium is only about 3.5 to 5. Why is potassium so much lower? It's because it's all inside the cells, and therefore not floating around freely in the blood like sodium is. So, how does the nerve cell signal other cells? Well, all along this axon, there are a lot of sodium and potassium channels. And at rest, these channels are closed. In order to open them, they must be signaled by an electrical impulse. When the cell body is signaled by another cell, it will funnel an electrical impulse down into the axon. And at this point, the sodium channels begin to open. As sodium floods into the cell, it's going to make the inside become more positive until eventually a threshold is achieved. This is called depolarization, the loss of the resting electrical charge. As depolarization occurs, the sodium channels adjacent to them also open, which is what allows the signal to be carried down the length of the nerve. And as this happens, potassium channels open, causing potassium to exit the cell. This is what causes repolarization, a reset of the charge of the cell at rest. Non-action potential is an all or none phenomenon, meaning it either happens or it doesn't. If a cell doesn't reach threshold, it won't fire. And if it does reach threshold, it fires completely. There is no partial action potential. And as the signal reaches the axon terminals, the mechanism for continuing the signal to the muscle fibers is going to change slightly, which brings us to the neuromuscular junction. This is where the nerve meets the muscle fiber. So how does the neuron signal to the muscle fiber that it needs to contract? This is a busy picture here, but just follow along the numbers with me one at a time. To orient you to the picture, the top portion is the axon terminal, and the base of the photo is the muscle fiber. This is also known as the motor end plate. All of the red dots floating around in between and in those little bubbles of the axon terminal are acetylcholine molecules. So let's start at step number one. We've reached the end of our axon as the action potential has traveled down the length of the neuron. We're at the axon terminal. Step number two. As the action potential reaches the terminal, it causes calcium channels to open. Think of calcium as the hook that allows these vesicles to attach to the base membrane of the nerve. Step three. Acetylcholine is then dumped into the synaptic cleft, the gap between the terminal and the muscle fiber. Step number four, acetylcholine then diffuses across the cleft and, step five, attaches to the acetylcholine receptors. Now these are just sodium channels that require acetylcholine to open them rather than an electrical signal. When two acetylcholine molecules bind to the receptor, the channel will open and sodium will flood in, just like it did along the axon. This is going to cause the same action potential effect in the muscle fiber that it did along the neuron. Step six, adjacent sodium channels will send the signal along the length of the muscle fiber. The actual mechanics of muscle contraction are beyond our needs for this lecture, so just remember that acetylcholine receptors opening is required for muscle contraction. Step seven, the last step is what ends the signal. 
We have to be able to end the signal or else our muscles would be contracting all the time. There's an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase located in the folds of the motor end plate. These are the little blue dots you see around the receptors. These break down acetylcholine very quickly, ending the signal from the neuron. And these will come into play later when we talk about our reversal agents. So that's our quick refresher on the signaling of muscle contraction. Feel free to pause this lecture at any time and come back to reference this picture if needed. And in a few slides, we're actually going to zoom in a little more on the acetylcholine receptors to get an even closer look at how our drugs work. So how do our drugs work to block this process? The drugs we use are called competitive antagonists. You may remember from your pharmacokinetics lecture that these drugs have to compete with other substances to bind to their desired receptors. Antagonists will bind to a receptor but not activate it. As such, our paralytic agents will lock onto an acetylcholine receptor without activating it and simultaneously prevent acetylcholine from binding and activating it. This leaves our muscles unable to contract since the action potential cannot traverse the synaptic cleft. If the acetylcholine receptors don't activate, there is no muscle contraction. Simple concept, right? You can't call a friend on your cell phone if the satellite that relays the signal is broken, even if both of the phones are working fine. It's a similar idea for our muscles. Without the signal, there is no contraction. So why do we use these drugs in the first place? Well, our first purpose for these drugs as anesthesia providers is to facilitate intubation. The jaw and the airway muscles are tight and make it really difficult to intubate without relaxing them first. Second, some surgeries just require muscle relaxation. Many abdominal surgeries, especially the laparoscopic ones, total joint replacements, spinal surgeries, open heart, thoracotomies, robotic surgeries, and others. Third, they just facilitate the work of the surgeon by reducing muscle tension when opening and closing the incision, or when anatomy manipulation is required, such as with joint replacements. And last but not least, patient safety is maintained with these drugs. Some surgeries are performed on very sensitive anatomy, like the heart or lungs. Even though these patients are anesthetized with IV drugs and inhalation agents, they can still have reflexive movement, such as coughing. The patients aren't necessarily aware when this happens because they are anesthetized, but we like to prevent coughing in situations when even small movements can cause inadvertent lacerations with surgical tools. So we're not just using them without reason. They serve a very important purpose. Let's look at the types of neuromuscular blocking drugs. There are only two classes, depolarizing and non-depolarizing. The depolarizing drugs bind to the acetylcholine receptor and activate it, but then stay attached to the receptor, preventing it from reactivating. The non-depolarizing drugs simply bind to the acetylcholine receptor and prevent it from opening in the first place. To make a little more sense of this idea, let's look at this picture to the right. This is the progression of opening and closing for the acetylcholine receptor. The bottom left is our resting state. The channel is closed and sodium cannot pass through it. When acetylcholine binds the receptor here and here, the channel opens. And yes, it does take two acetylcholine molecules to activate a channel. This moves us straight up where the channel is open now, allowing sodium to travel through. But the channel only stays open briefly, approximately one to two milliseconds. This moves us to the top right picture. Notice here as well that there is a little green circle at the base of the receptor. Think of this as a safety latch. After a channel is open briefly, the latch will close, effectively blocking further diffusion of sodium. This is the inactive state. Even though the channel is physically open, the latch has inactivated it. The receptor cannot fire again from this state. It has to be reactivated by repolarizing. This happens when acetylcholine detaches from the receptor, allowing for repolarization to take place, which takes about two to five milliseconds. So this is a very fast process, 
A decent analogy for this is a gun with only one bullet. You've got a gun that's cocked and loaded, and this is the resting state. When you pull the trigger, the bullet fires. That's the open state. At this point, though, the ammunition has been expended, so the gun is unable to fire again as it currently is. It must be reloaded and cocked again, which will bring it back to its resting state. So, back to our drugs. The depolarizing drugs work by attaching to the receptor and activating it, but the drug will remain on the receptor after activation. This leaves it in its inactivated state until the drug is taken away. Non-depolarizing drugs work by simply binding to the receptor in its resting state and leaving it here until it's removed from the receptor. So we're finally getting to look at some of our drugs. We're gonna start with our depolarizing neuromuscular blocking drugs, which should be simple since there's only one. Succinylcholine is the only depolarizing drug we use in anesthesia. It's a very fast acting agent. It's fast on and fast off. Time of onset is about 60 seconds and it lasts about four to five minutes until the patient can begin breathing again with complete reversal in 10 to 12 minutes. Its main use nowadays is to facilitate endotracheal intubation during anesthesia induction. And this is because of its short duration, which proves to be especially beneficial if the surgery does not require muscle relaxation. It's also the drug of choice for rapid sequence induction, or RSI. This is when we give propofol and succinylcholine simultaneously and also hold pressure on the cricoid cartilage, which is done to occlude the esophagus. This is done in situations when intubation needs to be done for the safety of the patient, but their NPO status is inadequate or unknown, such as in trauma patients or emergency C-sections. The goal of RSI is to prevent vomiting and aspiration in high-risk patients, so we like drugs that work quickly. Now, succinylcholine is also metabolized differently than our other neuromuscular blocking drugs. There's an enzyme called pseudocholinesterase that is very similar to acetylcholinesterase, but does not break down acetylcholine. This enzyme's activity is the reason the drug only lasts a short while. And it's important to note that a small number of people do have genetic variances that affect the pseudocholinesterase enzyme's ability. In these patients, the enzyme is much slower, resulting in prolonged paralysis anywhere between one and six hours. These patients will require post-op ventilation until the drugs wear off. And because it's so rare, we don't test people for it prior to surgery. But if we do find that someone has a very prolonged effect from the drug, then we would make sure to note it in his or her chart and avoid it in the future. They would also need to undergo genetic testing to confirm, and most likely his or her family members would need testing, as this characteristic can be shared amongst relatives. Now you'll see in this slide that succinylcholine has some potentially significant side effects. A lot of these have to do with its depolarizing effect. Remember that because it is initially causing that depolarization of the muscle fibers, that those fibers are going to contract. And since we can't just direct our drugs to one area of the body, this causes all of the skeletal muscles of the entire body to contract before relaxing. We call these contractions fasciculations. All of the muscles spastically contract for about 10 to 15 seconds at about the 30 second mark after administration. Sometimes in patients with significant muscle mass, this can be a big display with arms coming off the table, but in most, it looks like twitching the whole body for a few seconds. However, this can cause fairly significant muscle pain or myalgias over the following days. It's the same concept as working out really hard after not working out for a long time. That intense feeling of soreness you get the next couple of days is the exact same soreness some people feel the following days after getting this drug. Not everyone has it, but plenty do. Some anesthesia providers will treat this by giving a very small dose of a non-depolarizing drug just prior to giving succinylcholine, which prevents the fasciculations from occurring. However, not everyone utilizes this technique. Next is an increase in potassium. Remember how potassium is inside the cells at rest. Well, if we contract every skeletal muscle in the body at once, 
that's a decent amount of potassium that's exiting the cell and entering the extracellular fluid at one time. And some of that will enter the vasculature, which is why we see this rise in potassium. This is a transient effect, however, which returns to baseline in about 10 to 15 minutes. But checking electrolyte levels before giving this drug is very important, especially if a patient has kidney disease, because they often have higher baseline potassium levels and the increase in potassium is less predictable. Use of succinylcholine is contraindicated if potassium is greater than 5.5, but many people will still avoid it if greater than 5. The next four side effects are a result of succinylcholine similar structure to acetylcholine. It can actually activate some other cholinergic receptors in the body. And we'll look into where these receptors are in a little bit when we look at our reversal drugs. But for now, just know that it can cause bradycardia in children, increased intracranial pressure, increased intraocular pressure, and increased intragastric pressure. Now for the bradycardia in children, we avoid succinylcholine except in emergencies. And when we do give it, we also give some atropine to counter the bradycardia it can cause. In patients with increased or suspected increased intracranial pressure, we would avoid it. In patients with glaucoma, we would avoid it. Intragastric pressure is not something we normally measure and this rarely causes any noticeable symptoms, but it's worth noting that it can occur. We talked about the prolonged blockade in genetically predisposed patients, leaving us with malignant hyperthermia, or MH. You probably remember hearing this in your lecture on the volatile anesthetic agents. Succinylcholine is the only other anesthetic drug we use that can cause MH. I won't spend much time on it for that reason, but just remember that it can cause elevated temperature, tachycardia, significant muscle rigidity, acidosis, and irregular respirations and it's treated with a drug called dantrolene. We don't know the exact mechanism for why it causes MH, only that it does. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, wow, this drug sounds pretty harmful. The reality is that the serious side effects of this drug are usually avoided by not giving it to those who are at high risk, as we talked about. And the prolonged blockade and MH it causes are extremely rare. And the truth is that it just works really well. It does the job it's needed for very well, and some people still avoid it because of the side effects, but many people will continue to use it until something else comes along to replace it. Now we're gonna switch gears and talk about the non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking drugs. As the name implies, these drugs do not cause depolarization at the neuromuscular junction like succinylcholine does. So let's see how these drugs work. So here's a little background information for you about where our non-depolarizers came from. This is the curare plant, also known as Chondrodendron tomentosum. It's a vine found in South America that was originally used as a poison by indigenous tribes. They would crush it up and dip their arrows into it before hunting to aid in killing their prey. Now we know now the mechanism of how this plant works. It causes paralysis, specifically of the diaphragm, and as a result, the animals would suffocate and die. Pretty harsh, but effective. It was not until the 1930s that scientists began to apply the effects of the plant to drugs that could be used for anesthesia and surgery. But since then, there's been a lot of research and development, and there will continue to be well into the future. This is a list of several non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking drugs, and there are others not listed here that are not really seen in practice anymore. But you may notice that they all contain the stem C-U-R in the middle of their names as a result of being developed from the curare plant we just discussed. But they're categorized based on their duration of action, short, intermediate, and long acting. Now I've highlighted the intermediate acting class because these are really the only drugs you'll see being used currently. And even then, a couple of them are still very infrequently seen. Rocuronium is the most common drug we use, for reasons we'll come to shortly, followed by vecuronium. Atricurium and cisatricurium are not used as frequently, but are typically reserved for special considerations. But they all have very similar durations of action. However, keep in mind that duration is very dose-dependent, so these numbers are just averages.
Now let's look at the time of onset in this table. You'll see that rock uranium has the fastest onset of the four. When given in higher doses, it can actually get down to about the same time of onset as succinylcholine, about 45 to 90 seconds. So why don't we use rock uranium to intubate everyone with? Well, when we give it at doses high enough to achieve this quick onset, it lasts much longer, up to 90 minutes. The 30 to 40 minute duration we see in this table is more related to intraoperative dosing, which is typically less than an intubating dose. The other drugs take a few minutes to achieve the desired level of relaxation, and so are not used for intubation, unless ricuronium is unavailable, which has actually been the case recently due to some issues with the manufacturer. However, that seems to have resolved at this point. You may also notice that the elimination half-life does not seem to match up with the duration of action. This is a result of redistribution. You may remember this concept from your pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics lecture. This is the idea that a drug moves away from the receptors back into the vasculature, cannot exert their effects on the receptor. And since the only part of the drug that is metabolized is the drug in the vasculature, that means that the drug at the receptors are not being metabolized until they redistribute back into blood circulation. So as a result, the half-life is different from the duration of action. So let's start with rocuronium and vecuronium, which are actually very similar to each other. They're both aminosteroid compounds. Vecuronium is metabolized by the liver and kidneys and does have an active metabolite with 80% of the potency of vecuronium. Rocuronium is excreted unchanged in bile and urine. Now we talked in the previous slide about how rocuronium has a much faster onset, but can last much longer at doses used for induction. Despite its long duration of action, it can be used as an alternative to succinylcholine for RSI. If there are obvious contraindications to succinylcholine, rocuronium is the only other option for a true RSI, and we'll just have to accept and deal with its duration. Vecuronium is six times more potent than rocuronium, which simply means we can give less drug to achieve the same results. Anaphylaxis has been described with rocuronium, but it is extremely rare and some have even questioned the validity of the diagnosis. Fortunately, these drugs do not have any other major side effects. Now, these two drugs are the bread and butter of our paralytics. 99% of the time, one of these two is the drug that was used to relax your patient during surgery. Now let's talk about atricurium and cisatricurium. These drugs are not aminosteroids, but rather benzoisoquinolin compounds. What makes these two drugs unique is that they are not metabolized by the liver or kidneys. They utilize something called Hoffman degradation, as well as nonspecific plasma esterases. Hoffman degradation is a process that is influenced by body temperature as well as pH. As temperature and pH increase, so does the rate of metabolism. If temperature and pH go down, metabolism slows down. I've actually seen this before in a patient that we were struggling to keep warm intraoperatively, and towards the end of the surgery, the patient was still deeply paralyzed, even though our dosing indicated that it should have worn off by then. Eventually, we were able to reverse it, but we had to wait a little bit. The plasma esterases are just enzymes that float around in our blood. They actually work on a few other drugs as well, such as esmolol and remifentanil. But both of these processes work together to metabolize these drugs. And as you can imagine, this can be a huge benefit for patients with liver or kidney disease. We don't have to worry about prolonged effects and trying to guess how long rocuronium or vecuronium are gonna stick around. We can just use one of these two drugs instead. Now, a couple of important things to note about atricurium. One of the metabolic byproducts of atricurium is a compound called laudanosine. This compound has been shown to cause seizures in animals, but only in doses higher than we use for anesthesia. However, toxicity from this compound is still a concern to look out for. And two, atricurium causes histamine release, especially when we give it at higher dose ranges. This causes hypotension, tachycardia, and skin flushing, which sounds and looks a lot like anaphylaxis, but it's not a true anaphylactic reaction, 
but it's this histamine release that has caused atricarium to fall out of favor by a lot of practitioners. Cisatricarium was actually developed as a drug that would not have this exact issue. It's actually an enantiomer of atricarium, or one of its isomers that was isolated from the other. Now, while cisatricarium technically can cause histamine release, the doses required to do so are so high that we never encounter them clinically, which essentially eliminates the histamine release problem. And laudanosine production is significantly smaller as well thus eliminating this concern clinically. The major disadvantage is that it is expensive, so a lot of people will still use atricurium for liver and kidney patients before cisatricurium. Although, if a drip were to be used, cisatricurium would most likely be the choice since a drip will often be on a longer period of time. So, we've made it through our neuromuscular blocking agents. Now, we're gonna talk about how we reverse the effect of these drugs. And to do this, it will be helpful to discuss some of the anatomy and physiology that these drugs work on before talking about the drugs themselves. Just like we did with the neuromuscular blocking drugs, if you understand the underlying physiology, you're going to have a much easier time remembering what these reversal agents do and what to be aware of with them. Wow. Another busy picture, but I promise you will understand it all by the end of this slide. Don't worry so much about the words yet, just look at the pictures with me. This is the autonomic nervous system at a 30,000 foot view. The autonomic nervous system is responsible for unconscious bodily functions. You don't have to think about making your heart pump, it just happens. You don't have to think about your kidneys making urine, it just happens. The autonomic nervous system is broken down into two parts, the sympathetic half and the parasympathetic half. They both work on the same organs, but they work in opposite directions. The sympathetic nervous system is your fight or flight system. The sympathetic supercharges you, while the parasympathetic nervous system is your rest and digest system. The parasympathetic pacifies you. So for the sympathetic system on the right side of the picture, I want you to imagine a scenario where you're walking through the woods and all of a sudden you see a huge bear jump out and it's charging you. What bodily functions are you going to need in that moment? Let's go top to bottom looking at the organs under the sympathetic side. Eyes. You need to be able to visualize as much of your surroundings as possible. The eyes are going to dilate to let as much light in as possible and increase your field of vision. Next is the salivary glands. Would salivating help you fight or run from a bear? Not really. So that function will be dialed back by the sympathetic system. The heart. If you're about to fight or run for your life, you need to be delivering more oxygen to your muscles and other organs. So your heart is going to ramp up its rate and contractile strength to increase cardiac output. The lungs. In this scenario, your body is in overdrive and you need as much oxygen as you can get to support it. So the lungs are going to breathe faster, open up your airways and take deeper breaths. The stomach. Do you want your stomach and GI tract exerting a bunch of energy breaking down food in a life or death situation? Not really. So the sympathetic system decreases its activity. Liver. One of its main functions is glucose production and breakdown of glycogen stores for energy. This is helpful for keeping energy levels higher for all of the other body parts that are having increased metabolic needs, so its functions increase. Secretion of epinephrine and norepinephrine. These are the actual hormones that the sympathetic system uses to signal the organs it wants to communicate with. We'll take a little closer look at this in our next slide. Bladder and kidneys. If you're in a life or death situation, do you want your kidneys making a bunch of urine so you'll have to stop and pee? Not very beneficial in that moment, so it slows down blood flow to the kidneys. Same with the bladder. Stopping to urinate isn't very helpful, so the detressor muscle of the bladder relaxes to avoid pressure to urinate. Now let's walk through the parasympathetic nervous system. This is the rest and digest system, the exact opposite of the sympathetic system. Think about relaxing on the couch after a nice dinner 
turning down the lights and putting on your favorite show to relax. What functions of the body are working in this scenario? Let's go top to bottom again. The eyes. All your focus is on the TV at the moment. You don't need to see every possible thing in the room, so the pupils will constrict to reduce light input. Salivary glands. We're digesting a meal right now, so they're going to be increasing saliva production. The heart. We're not running or fighting for our lives here, so it's going to slow down its blood pumping. The lungs aren't working overtime right now either. We're resting, so they slow down. The GI tract is of course going to be the primary component of food digestion, so its activity is definitely going to be ramped up. The liver doesn't need to worry about glucose production. We're getting that from the meal that's being broken down in the belly. So new glucose production is inhibited, but bile is secreted to aid in digestion of your meal. The kidneys and bladder are going to become more active so that we can urinate in peace. So, why all of this information? Now, let's zoom in a little bit here. We're still looking at the autonomic nervous system, but rather than the 30,000 foot view, this is at the cellular level. We still have the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems shown separately and with receptors shown as well. This is a two-step process. The nerves are traveling from the spine to the organ via two nerves. So let's walk through the sympathetic side to start. Starting at the top, our action potential is traveling down and releases acetylcholine onto the second nerve. The receptors here are nicotinic receptors. So the action potential continues down the second nerve, and here it releases catecholamines like norepinephrine instead of acetylcholine. Norepinephrine interacts with adrenergic receptors. These are the alpha and beta receptors that you're familiar with. That's it, just a couple of steps. The parasympathetic system also has a two-step process that starts the same way. The action potential travels from the spine along the first nerve and releases acetylcholine onto a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. This continues the action potential down to the organ, but here's where we see a difference. Instead of adrenergic receptors, we see a muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. These are unique to the parasympathetic system. And so if we increase acetylcholine levels, those molecules will directly stimulate the muscarinic receptors on these organs. This tricks the organ into thinking that the parasympathetic system is ramping up its activity. Think back to the previous slide, or even pause and go back and look. What happens to the body when the parasympathetic system increases its activity? We see bradycardia, bronchoconstriction, increased salivation, increased GI, GI activity, urine production, etc. We don't stimulate the sympathetic system with acetylcholine because we still need the catecholamines to signal the organs directly. The main point here is that increasing acetylcholine levels will directly stimulate parasympathetic activity in the body. And this is important because the way we reverse neuromuscular blockade is by increasing acetylcholine levels in the body. Again, I go through all of that with you because if you understand the underlying physiology, nothing here will catch you by surprise. You won't be memorizing a list of side effects because these drugs will just fit the narrative you already know. Now, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors are the drugs we use to reverse neuromuscular blockade. Or to simplify, you can just shorten it to cholinesterase inhibitors. Remember when we talked about the neuromuscular junction that after an action potential signals a muscle fiber with acetylcholine, the acetylcholine is broken down by the enzyme acetylcholinesterase. These drugs work by stopping the activity of acetylcholinesterase. And if we do that, the overall amount of acetylcholine in the body is going to increase. We're creating acetylcholine without breaking it down. And for our uses, we're thinking specifically of increasing acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. This works because our neuromuscular blocking drugs are competitive antagonists. They compete with acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction for those receptors. With more free acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft at the neuromuscular junction, they're able to knock off the neuromuscular blocking drug from the receptors, freeing them to again be reactivated by the acetylcholine there and cause muscle contraction again. This is how we reverse neuromuscular blockade today. The main drugs we use in this category are neostigmine, edrophonium, and peridostigmine.
and neostigmine is by far the most common one used. Physostigmine is also in the same class, but it crosses the blood-brain barrier, so we don't use it. Now, what are the side effects of cholinesterase inhibitors? Let's just read through these and we'll talk a little more after. Side effects include one, at the heart, bradyarrhythmias, possibly even asystole. Two, at the salivary glands, increased secretions. Three, the GI tract, we're gonna see increased secretions and peristalsis. Four, at the kidneys and bladder, we're gonna stimulate urine production and excretion. Five, at the eyes, we're gonna stimulate meiosis or pupil constriction. Six, the lungs, bronchoconstriction. Wow, now these drugs have a lot of side effects and some of them are potentially very dangerous. But take a second and look at this list. What do these side effects all have in common? They are all a result of increased parasympathetic activity. Remember that with all drugs, we can't tell it to only go to a specific body part. They're gonna to go to every receptor that will accept it. With acetylcholine, we can't limit it to the neuromuscular junction to knock off our paralytic drug. It's gonna work on the whole body. And as a result, we see these side effects, the major one being significant bradycardia. So how do we use them safely? We have to give another type of drug with it called an antimuscarinic drug. They're often called anticholinergics, which is true because they are blocking acetylcholine receptors, but it's not fully accurate. These drugs don't have any effect on the nicotinic receptors, only the muscarinic receptors. Therefore, antimuscarinic is more accurate. They're also called parasympatholytic drugs as they're effectively cutting off the effects of the parasympathetic nervous system. These absolutely must be given with a cholinesterase inhibitor. Otherwise, we would see major parasympathetic effects. Again, the most problematic of which is the large bradycardia response. Without these anti-muscarinic drugs, we would stop our patients' hearts. There are other benefits too. We would avoid severe bronchoconstriction so they can breathe adequately. Reducing secretions is helpful when extubating a patient so they don't get on the cords and cause them to spasm. This also prevents people from going to the bathroom on themselves because we just hammer their GI and urinary systems. Now the three major drugs in this category are scopolamine, atropine, and glycopyrrolate, or Robinol. Now we rarely use scopolamine IV because it can cause significant sedation, which can delay recovery. Its major use now is as a transdermal patch for its antiemetic properties. For this reason, we'll just continue talking about Robinol and atropine. So let's compare and contrast. Due to structural differences, Robinol does not cross the blood-brain barrier, while atropine does. This crossing of the blood-brain barrier is what makes atropine cause minor sedation, although it really is minor, if present at all. This is why scopolamine causes major sedation, actually, because it much more readily crosses the blood-brain barrier. But this is part of the reason we prefer Robinol, since it has most of its effects on the peripheral nervous system rather than also on the central nervous system. This allows us to reduce the overall side effects. Time of onset is fairly similar with Robinol at approximately one minute and atropine being a little faster at 45 seconds. This is partially why atropine is better suited for emergency situations. Seconds count in emergencies. Now, Robinol is often given at a low dose to reduce secretions in the patient, as well as to increase the heart rate if needed. Atropine can do both of these things too, but it hits the heart a lot harder and it can often cause more tachycardia than we want. So we don't typically use it as a prophylactic drug. You'll see here as well that these drugs have a lot of side effects too. But again, let's read through the list on the left and see what they have in common. Tachycardia, bronchodilation, decreased appetite and constipation, urinary retention, dry mouth, blurry vision, and sedation, although not with Robinol. What do they have in common? These are all symptoms of increased sympathetic activity. By cutting off the parasympathetic system, we're allowing a stronger reign of the sympathetic system.
these two systems are pulling in opposite directions. So we have to dose these patients in such a way that it doesn't push them too far in either direction. And as mentioned, we can give small doses of these by themselves, but with the doses we need to reverse paralysis, we need higher dosing. On the right of the slide, you'll see some stronger symptoms that would be indicative of an overdose of an anti-muscarinic drug. These include significant confusion, hallucinations, significant tachycardia, hot flushed skin, fever, and dizziness. This is actually a common mnemonic to help remember these side effects that you might see in an anti-muscarinic overdose. Hot as a hair, dry as a bone, blind as a bat, red as a beet, and mad as a hatter. Remember, hot as a hair refers to the fever and hyperthermia. Dry as a bone refers to the reduced secretions. Blind as a bat refers to the pupil dilation resulting in blurry vision. Red as a beet refers to the skin flushing. And mad as a hatter refers to the confusion. Now, Sugamidex is a very new drug that is changing the game for reversal of neuromuscular blockade. It's been available in Europe since 2008, but the FDA requested more studies before approving it in the US in 2016. Instead of the indirect reversal we see with neostigmine, this drug directly binds to our aminosteroid compounds, rocuronium and vecuronium, with a slightly higher affinity for rocuronium. Once bound, the paralytic drug can no longer have any effect at the neuromuscular junction, and it is then metabolized and excreted. It is important to note that Sucamidex does not work for atricurium or cisatricurium. These will still need to be reversed with neostigmine. It is truly remarkable though how quickly and effectively it works. Within a couple of minutes, depending on how deeply they're blocked at the time of administration, they will be completely reversed. And if adequately dosed, there should be no lingering paralytic agent still having an effect. The biggest drawback right now is that it's very new, and as we know, new drugs are expensive. We like to have it as a backup in situations where we need to wake a patient up quickly, but we still reserve its use due to cost. But eventually, as costs come down, it will probably be the only drug we use. One interesting side effect is that it can interfere with birth control. So if administered, patients need to be counseled to use other methods of contraceptive for a week after surgery. I don't know how many people are going to be ready for sexual activity within a week of surgery, but who knows. Now, why is all of this so important? Well, as the PACU nurses, you are the ones who are taking care of these patients immediately after we've given them all of these drugs. And you all do an awesome job of that. We want you to be rock solid in your grasp on these drugs because they have the potential to be extremely dangerous, especially if we start becoming cavalier on our handling of them. So let's touch base on something called residual paralysis, which is exactly what it sounds like, the remaining effects of lingering neuromuscular blocking drug in a patient. As many as 40% of patients may have some level of blockade when arriving in the PACU. That's no small number, but it's not so obvious. We aren't dropping off one out of every two to three patients not breathing. These patients may be awake and breathing spontaneously, but they're just not back to their full strength. This is not because anesthesia providers are being careless, but rather due to limitations of our monitors. And we'll talk about these monitors in the next couple of slides. They provide very good information, but the readings are somewhat subjective to the provider. It's helpful, but it's not perfect. And this is where the residual paralysis comes in. So what does this look like to you in the PACU? Patients are going to be more prone to desaturation, airway obstruction, use of accessory muscles for respiration, and perhaps even complain of feeling weak. All of this leads to a longer recovery. You may also see signs and symptoms of the reversal agents that we mentioned as well. All of these drugs may still have lingering effects during recovery. The monitor we use to look at depth of neuromuscular blockade is called a peripheral nerve stimulator, also known as a twitch monitor. It simply delivers an electrical stimulus to a nerve, causing contraction of a muscle. This picture shows placement at the ulnar nerve, which would cause thumb contraction. The tests we use are called train of four and sustained tetany, 
which we will take a look at in our next slide. This picture has everything you need to know about Twitch monitors. Take a look at the right side of the picture. In the top right, we see specifically where we would place our electrodes, and beneath them, we see the color-coordinated nerves and motor responses at each site. The ulnar nerve stimulates the adductor pollicis, which adducts the thumb. The facial nerve stimulates the orbicularis oculi, which closes the eyelid, and the corrugator supercilii, which furrows the brow. And the posterior tibial nerve stimulates the flexor hallucis brevis, which flexes the big toe. Now let's turn to the graph portion of the picture. Take a look at the first row labeled tetany. In the left column, we see our baseline reading with no block. This will look like a strong, sustained muscle contraction. You'll notice that depolarizing and non-depolarizing agents have slightly different effects here. The depolarizing agent, or succinylcholine, simply produces a weaker contraction for the duration of stimulation compared to baseline. This is referred to as a phase one block. Whereas the non-depolarizers have a drop off as the stimulation continues. This is called fade and is referred to as a phase two block. It's not until the absence of fade with sustained tetany that we can safely assume full reversal has been achieved. The train of four test is four quick sequential bursts rather than one long stimulation, but we see the same pattern. The depolarizers simply reduce the strength of contraction without producing fade, while the non-depolarizers do produce fade. Each twitch is weaker than the preceding twitch. And depending on how deeply blocked they are, we can even lose twitches. For surgery requiring relaxation, we usually try to keep them at a reading of one to two out of four. It is possible to achieve zero out of four, but this makes it very difficult to determine a time until we get a single twitch back. So we try to always keep at least one twitch. Now I mentioned limitations to this monitor earlier, so let's talk about those. One, it is extremely difficult to determine exactly what level of fade is present by the provider. While we can see and feel the fade of muscle contraction, the actual amount of fade is difficult to assign a value without highly specialized equipment and the degree of fade plays into muscle strength as much as the presence of fade itself. Two, a patient with a train of four reading of four out of four twitches can still have up to 75% of acetylcholine receptors blocked. 75% of acetylcholine receptors can still be blocked in someone with four full twitches. This is why we look to sustain tetany as a better guide for full reversal. Once the presence of fade is gone during sustained tetany, we know the patient is safe to extubate. Three, we mentioned in the last slide that larger muscles recover first, while smaller muscles take longer to recover from blockade. The nerve you choose to test will have correlation with other muscles in the body. For example, the facial nerve innervates some larger muscles of the face, and this nerve correlates more closely to the diaphragm strength than would the ulnar nerve. However, the nerves of the larynx and the trachea that contract those airway muscles are very small compared to the diaphragm. So if we're monitoring the facial nerve, consider that even if you have a strong train of four reading and the patient is breathing, the actual airway muscles may still be weak. The ulnar nerve correlates a lot more closely with the airway muscle strength. And we have to consider this when recovering from blockade. Now, you most likely will not be using twitch monitors very often. Although it's not unheard of, especially in the occasional patient that comes to pack you still intubated and ventilated. So how can you evaluate a patient's muscle strength without a twitch monitor? These are some simple tests that you are probably familiar with that can be a good guide. I put sustained head or leg lift first because this is the gold standard for reversal of paralytic. However, it can be difficult to get a patient that's groggy to sustain a head lift, even if they are strong enough to do so. But we have other options, such as opening the eyes, strong hand squeeze, protrusion of the tongue, purposeful movement, a strong cough, sustained bite on a tongue blade, and the ability to swallow. These are just some quick and easy ways to determine someone's strength. If the patient is not performing well on these, then you could consider the use of a nerve stimulator. Thank you very much for your attention.
and I hope this presentation has been beneficial and educational for you. If you'd like more detailed information on all the topics we discussed, I'd like to recommend Drain's Peri-Anesthesia Nursing Textbook. It goes into greater detail about a lot of these things like nerve stimulators, and it also covers things like how these drugs work differently on patients with neuromuscular disorders and some other factors that can affect duration of blockade. Chapter 23 is the one you'll want. Thank you again. We hope you've enjoyed this fifth lecture in the series. We have created a seven lecture series covering many techniques used in anesthesia. We have specifically focused on the need of the PACURN and hope you will find time to view the other six lectures as well. The lecture series include this lecture, Neuromuscular Blocking Agent, and the following six lectures, Basic Principles of Pharmacology, Inhalation Anesthesia, Non-Opioid Intravenous Anesthetics, Opioid Intravenous Anesthetics, Local Anesthetics, and Regional Anesthesia. All lectures are available on the Palmetto Health Internet as well as on stormanesthesia.com forward slash education forward slash PACU forward slash PACU videos.